Ooh, <laughs> that's a tough one. Oh. <laughs> so there's a difference between how I would describe myself and what I want to be. I'd like to say I'm a loving mom, um, sometimes strict. On the outside, I look like I've got it all together, and on the inside, I'm just a mess. Some days are better than others, but I do my best. I would say that guilt is probably something I struggle with the most. Am I making the right decisions? Am I doing about what's best for them? Some days it's definitely hard to be patient and I feel like we're always running behind. My child wears me out, so sometimes at the end of the day I'm just exhausted and I, I hope that she doesn't notice that. But the unknown is such a scary thing and, and trying to make the right choices without having the crystal ball to know what the right answer is. That's been a struggle. I love that my mom, Mr. T, um, gives me big hugs and kisses. She's willing to bend over backwards and do things for the family. Well, most people think that moms are just amazing just because they buy them stuff. But she's amazing because she knows right from wrong with us. My mom's special because she's sweet and loving. She earns everything that she has, so she does work hard. She's always in my mind and my heart. At nighttime, we read a few stories, and then we pray. She, she reads me books. She does words with me because I can spell already. She is a masterpiece. My mom has taught us that faith lets us forgive willingly. And whatever she talks about and whatever problem you have, she'll talk to you about what God promises us. I hope I am like my mom to my children. I love my mom as much as Jesus loves us. Makes me feel like Maybe I am doing something right. No matter what's going on and whether we have good days or, or bad days, that, that they get it, that they are first. It does make you feel like you are being a good mom, even when you feel like you aren't. I know that my kids remember more of the good than the bad, and they think the world of us as parents, and it's nice to hear. You know, I think her expectation is just that I love her and hug her and give her kisses, and. You know, that's all she wants and what she really needs the most. Kids are our greatest blessing. We want to teach them they are loved no matter what. Wasn't that great? You know, I mentioned earlier when I wished the ladies a happy Mother's Day that at Concordia, here in our beloved family of faith, we celebrate all of the ladies who are here because we know that there are moms of all different types, all different circumstances. There are moms who have ch children biology, children who are adopted. There are moms who have no children. There are all kinds of circumstances. We also know that there are some moms in our midst who are having the best day of their life. And there are lots of others who are not. We know that is for lots of reasons. Struggles in the family or grief Maybe they're families that are struggling because the mom that they've loved and cherished isn't there. There are a lot of reasons that Mother's Day can be a less than celebratory day. And so we want all of you who maybe aren't having that, that pinnacle moment of your, of your life today to know that we're glad you're here anyway because we love you and we are grateful for you. While we can't make those heartaches go away, we can celebrate who you are and how very much you mean to all of us. And so, happy Mother's Day. We also begin today a new sermon series. It's called Virtuoso. How many know what a virtuoso is? So, uh, a masterpiece artist is a virtuoso in music, right? Someone who is ex exemplary, extraordinary, talented, and, and amazing. And we chose that title because we're going to be talking about the fruits of the Spirit. What's interesting is when we think about these fruits of the Spirit, these virtues, well, how many of you feel like you're a virtuoso? 
Boy, you don't know how relieving that is. I was sort of afraid I might be the only one. Yeah, we all fall way short, don't we? We want to be virtuosos. We want to be the, the very best. We want to be exemplary when it comes to being a mom or a dad or a kid. We want to be exemplary when it comes to be a husband or wife. We want to be exemplary and virtuous when it comes to all different parts of our lives. But the fact is, we fall so far short. You know, there was a, an interesting thing. Just about the time that you think that, that the culture doesn't care about virtue, because the truth is, it, it sort of feels like virtue and morality, all those kinds of things are drifting away. Something interesting happened this last week during the NFL draft. There was a, a player that was one of the most highly ranked players expected to go in the first few rounds of the NFL draft. It's a big deal. And just about the time the NFL draft started, there was a, a, a video clip that came out that impugned his character, caused questions to, to, to rise about who he was and, and what his values, what his virtues were all about. How many know the story I'm talking about? You remember what happened? That man, in spite of his amazing talent and his performance on the football field, he plummeted in the draft. And the message of that is that, that while we may say culturally that we don't care about all kinds of different virtues, the reality is that when it comes to our lives, the people we want to have around us, virtue matters. Because when someone is virtuous, when they're loving and kind and gracious and honest and forthright and gentle and self-controlled and all of those virtues, all of those fruit of the Spirit, the reality is when someone is like that, they're trustworthy, they're reliable. They make a positive difference. Again, the problem is, you and I, we fall flat all too often. There's a verse I want us to read together from Romans chapter 7. For what I do is not the good I want to do. No, the evil I do not want to do, this I keep on doing. Isn't that the truth? You and I, we know the good that we want to do, we want to do the right thing, and we try to do it, and for whatever reason, it seems like we are always coming up short. But there's the stuff we want to avoid. We don't want to do that stuff anymore, and so we try to pull away, but we're constantly feeling ourselves tugged back into it. See, there's a war that's raging inside. It's a war between that old sinful nature that goes back to the garden, that wants to be God of our own little world, and then there's that new nature, that Christ-like nature, that wants to follow the way of our God, live a masterpiece life, and there's a constant battle, and you and I feel it all the time. So what do we do? Well, one thing that, that seems like it might help is if we just try a little harder. How many have just tried a little harder? How's that work for you? You know, it sort of reminds me of a, an experience a couple of years ago. I was at a, a conference with a bunch of pastors, and Julie was with me, and uh, I like to get up early in the morning, and so uh, I got up, went out of the hotel room, went down to the, to the lobby where they had coffee and some tables, and I was working away and responding to some email and doing some things and, and having a cup of coffee, and when it was about time for Julie to get up, I thought, you know, I'll take coffee back up with me. So I had my computer, and I, I tucked that under my arm and to kind of hold it there tight, and I filled up two cups of coffee, and being the knucklehead that I am, when I say filled up, I mean filled up. Put a lid on both cups, and everything's fine. I'm walking along. I have the cups of coffee. I've got the computer. I'm consciously, you know, squeezing in my arm so there's no chance of that falling. That's all good until I get to the elevator. No problem, right? I'll just go sideways. I'll well, I can't go very far without tipping it over. You know what? That's an easy solution, right? I'll just put this cup on top of this cup, and I'll just hold this steady. This is not heavy. I've just got to keep that computer from falling out. A piece of cake. Just going to reach down and push the button. And about the time I pushed the button, I did just like that. I just a little, just a little error. But I felt, the, I felt the cup begin to slip. I felt the, that I was losing the balance, and so I did the most natural thing in the world. I just squeezed a little harder <laughs> on this paper cup. I'm an idiot. 
The cup collapsed, it spurts all over, the other cup falls on the floor, sploosh, splashes up on me. There is a giant mess and I am embarrassed because the reality is when you're holding a paper a coffee cup, squeezing harder doesn't work. When it comes to the fruit of the Spirit, working harder does not work. So what else can we do? Well, we ask for help. Because the interesting thing about the fruit of the Spirit is that it's not the fruit of me. It's the fruit of God's Spirit. You remember the, the Mother's, Day, Mother's Day presents that we used to make, I, I don't know if they still make them or not. You used to get them, honey. You know, where the kids would, would have a little pot and they would put dirt in it and the teacher would have them poke their finger in and they'd put a seed in there and they'd cover it over, you know, a flower or some other little kind of a plant and they'd bring it home and, and you'd water it, you know, and you'd put it in a window so it got warm and there was sunlight and eventually, you know, that, that little plant would spring up and everybody would rejoice. It was a miracle. But it wasn't the, the child, it wasn't the mom, it wasn't the water, it wasn't the sunlight that made it grow. It, it was the power that was in that seed already that God established. It's sort of like a minor little miracle. In fact, in Corinthians, Paul describes this from the perspective of our faith. He says, I planted the seed, Apollos watered, but, can we have the verse? God made it grow. Dear friends, when it comes to virtue, when it comes to the fruit of the Spirit, it's God's Spirit fruit. He uses us. He allows us to bear the fruit, but it is the fruit of the Spirit. And so instead of trying harder and failing over and over again, we need to ask for help. You know, there's a passage in John chapter 15 where Jesus describes this whole relationship and it's the whole picture of, of the vine and branches. In John 15, verse 6, he says, I am the vine, you are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Well, the, the fruit appears in our lives. We're living it out, but the reality is it comes from being connected to the vine. If, if a man remains to, connected to me, he will bear much fruit. But listen to this last part. Apart from me, you can do nothing. So over the course of this next several weeks, we're going to take a look at the, the fruit of the Spirit from Galatians. There's a powerful passage in Galatians chapter 5. It says, the acts of the sinful nature are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things, there is no law. Over the course of these weeks, we're going to strive to understand these fruit of the Spirit. And as we, we come to a clearer understanding, we're also going to try to figure out how it is that we ask for help and how it is that we can rely upon God to bear this fruit in our lives by His Spirit. So, let's talk about love. The very first of the fruit. Love is a big deal, isn't it? Huge deal in our world. I mean, the airwaves are filled with songs about love. Television programs and movies filled with stories about love. You and I depend on love. When we have people that love us in our lives and we love them, we feel a sense of fulfillment, a sense of joy and contentment. When we don't have people in our lives that love us, or we don't have people that we love, we have a sense of loneliness or emptiness. Love is a big Deal. And in God's word, love is enormous. It is a theme that reappears over and over and over again. So, for example, in Matthew chapter 22, Jesus says, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment, and the second is like it love your neighbor as yourself. In John 13, Jesus says, A new command I give you love one another. 
As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples. So the hallmark of the people who are followers of Jesus will not be their doctrine. It will not be their clothing. It won't be where they live. It will be the way that they love. All men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. John 14, verse 15. Jesus said, if you love me, Keep my commands. And then again in John 15, as the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Now remain in my love. We could read on and on and on. Love is an enormous theme. And God's love is always about how we live in this love relationship with God and how that love is to flow through us to the people around us. So what I want to do, I want to take uh, the time to talk about two things. Number one, what love is not. And then I want to circle back and talk about what love is in the context of 1 John 4, our scripture reading for today. Before we do, I came across this video that I really enjoyed. It's from Samaritan's Purse. And they ask a bunch of kids what love is. Watch what they say. Love is like over a gillion stuff. Helping someone even if you don't want to. When your parents or your teachers don't tell you to. Giving away stuff that you really, really like. If they want your toys, I'll share. Sale. Toys. It's smiling and saying good things about them. I should say, you have very nice clothes on. I hope my mommy. I played with another person on the playground when she didn't have anybody to play with. When people are loving to me, I feel like I should do it to someone else. Because Jesus is the same for us. It's like your daughter says you will have them do to you. That you should treat the other one just like I've been treated before. Not like bad, but the kind I've been good treated. Nobody really wants to play with somebody who's being mean. Being kind is helping those in need. Give them some food. Get fish and bread and green beans and peas and apples. I'll ask my mom and or dad, can we go get food for this hungry person that I found? Um, love is <laughs> hugging your mom and helping her wash the dishes. I just get the water thing and just spray them. People show me love by holding my hand. And they also give me a kiss from the head when I'm asleep very lightly. There's people that don't get love in other places of the world. You help them. Just help people. If we show people love, they can spread it all around the world. Okay, come here, Mommy. <laughs> I'll show her something. I'll show you something. Come here, Mommy. Neat, isn't it? What I love is how all of those kids have a different perspective, but they're all talking to us about actions, not just feelings or emotions. That really brings me to, to the first list. And I would encourage you, write this down, because think about this. Love is always a topic of conversation. And it may be that you have an opportunity to talk with someone and, and to discuss this whole topic. Maybe it's in the context of a favorite song or a relationship that someone is having. But the reality is that you and I can share the hope, the truth of God's Word in our lives winsomely when we're talking about things that matter, that matter to us. Love matters. So here are the three things that I want you to remember love is not. Number one, love is not a feeling. We act like it is, right? We act like it's this feeling that cannot be controlled. It goes wherever it wants. It takes over our thoughts and over our minds. That is nonsense. We may sing that it's that way, but you see, being in love or in lust is not love. Being whisked away by some momentary feeling, that is not love. Love is so much more, so much more substantive and solid and permanent than that. Number two, we live in a culture that that suggests to us that love is tolerance. It's not. I'll give you a little experiment to give it a try. 
Let's say later on today you are with your significant other. And you have a private moment. I want you to take them in your arms and I want you to say, oh my sweetheart, I tolerate you so much. <laughs> I see some of you guys are going to do that, right? It's not going to work well for you. Love is not tolerance. Number three, love is not passing. It's not fleeting. Love isn't something that's here one moment and gone the next, like some kind of apparition or vapor. Love is a permanent thing because it's not based on things that are unstable or disappearing. It brings me then to what I want to talk about, what love really is. And I want to do that from the context of 1 John chapter 4. Verse 7, this is a great chapter, by the way, another great chapter to memorize over time. Just read it every once in a while so it begins to sink into your heart, into your mind. But beginning at verse 7, it says, Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. Point number one, love is from God. Now, that may seem obvious, but we act, we think like it's not. We act like it's some kind of a, a force that's, that's apart from us or something that wells up inside of us. No, love is from God. And that means that not only is love outside of us and something that, that can be channeled through us, but it means to us that there is not an end to the love that we can demonstrate to the people around us. Remember back, some of you, in, in 1990, uh, Jay Leno did some commercials for Dorito. Anybody remember those? There's a tagline that's always kind of stuck in my mind. I brought one of them with me. You know, a lot of kids ask me, why can't I have nacho cheese Doritos tortilla chips for breakfast? Well, that's silly. You don't eat Doritos for breakfast. But hey, you sleep late. Get up at noon. Have them for lunch. <laughs> Crunch all you want. We'll make more. You catch that? Crunch all you want. We'll make more. Love is like that. Love is from God, and that means that there is no end to it. Love all you want. Expend it recklessly, generously, extravagantly. Or like the Scripture says in John 3, lavish love on the people around you. Be about love because you will never run to the end of it. God is love, and love comes from God, and so you can expend love all over as much as you want without an end to it. Now let's think about this. How often do you and I act like love is some kind of a commodity? We only give little bits of it. We act as if it's some kind of an elixir. You know, we pour it on things when we want it to do something. Instead of recognizing that love is something that's intended to be expended extravagantly on the people around us, not just when they deserve it, always. In marriage, how often do we act like love is something that our spouse will deserve instead of giving it lavishly? And if we want to follow the real example of our God, God did not hold back his love when we turned away from him. The scripture says that while you and I were still sinners, without any knowledge or hope of loving God, God gave his son for us. Dear brothers and sisters, the challenge this morning is that you and I would figure out those relationships where we're acting like love is some kind of a commodity and we would change our mindset. We would begin to love generously knowing that we will never exhaust the supply of love that God can provide in and through us. Number two, love is action even when it doesn't feel like it. Scripture, 1 John chapter 4 says, this is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. All too often we forget that love isn't just words. Love is action. 
When we love someone, it changes things. It causes us to act and to think in a whole different way. And when we follow the example of God's love, we come to the understanding God showed his love. He didn't just pronounce from on high that he loved all people. He sent his son. He showed his love. He sent him into our world. You know, when I think about that, I think about a book that came out a few years ago called The Love Dare. Anybody remember that book? The Love Dare was a, a book that was written for husbands and wives. And the idea was that, that in marriages, sometimes marriages have this tendency to drift apart. Couples can get caught up in all kinds of things and they can begin to, to view their relationship as sort of a measurement and it's easy to begin to have resentment and, and, and distance begin to, to create this wedge between two people. So the love dare was this exercise where each day husband and wife were invited to do something and there were prescribed ideas, things that you could do to show your love. Even if you didn't feel that love, you would do these actions and something amazing happens. Because when you and I choose to love, even if we don't feel the love, it begins to change our hearts, it begins to change our minds. You know, I remember an experience that that reminds me of this so closely. Years ago when I was first an, uh, an associate pastor, the seminary doesn't train you to be associate pastors. And, and so I, I came out of the seminary and I was trying to figure out how to do this and I had a senior pastor and we were very different. We viewed life and ministry in very different ways and it seemed like there was really more of this competition and, and I had resentment about things that he did or said or, or things he expected of me and I'm sure he had resentment about me and the things that I did and the way I went about it and there was this frustration that existed between us. Finally one day I went in and said to him, Pastor, here's the thing. I love this church, and I don't want to leave this church, but the truth is, the way our relationship is going, it seems like I need to put my name on a call list and, and take a call somewhere else. And he said, you know, I have to tell you, I'm not pleased with the way things are going either. We talked about it a bit, and we came to an agreement that before I would punch the eject button, we would commit once a week to pray together for each other. Now that may sound so obvious to you, but I have to tell you, it wasn't obvious to me. It was, a, it was a challenge. And it really took, on some days, it took everything I could muster to figure out what to pray about or what to pray for or what to be thankful for in the life of this man who was my supervisor, my senior pastor. But the amazing thing that happened over the course of several months as I prayed for him, I began to gain a, a new understanding and a new respect. I began to have a love for him that I didn't have before, and it changed our relationship. Dear friends, when you and I understand that love isn't about, it's not about what we say. It's about what we do. Love is action. And when we choose to take action in loving ways toward the people in our lives, our spouse, our family, our world, it not only changes them, it changes us. So number one, love is from God. Number two, love is an action. Let's go back to John, 1 John chapter 4. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Point number three, love is sacrifice. Now I know, I know that we, we get caught up in that whole idea of measuring, right? Right? We get caught up, we have this mentality of, of what's fair or what's equitable or what, what's equality. In fact, there's a danger. Oftentimes, in fact, I don't know of any couple in marriage that doesn't have to figure out how to share responsibility for the household. But you know one of the dangers in that, right? That as we share responsibilities and everybody sort of takes their own job, that we slip into this mentality where we start measuring who's doing what. And we always measure more favorably for the things that we're doing. And the problem is when we start putting our love in the box that, that has, goes along with fairness or equality, we always end up putting it in the wrong place because love is not about what's fair. Love is sacrifice. Let this picture settle into your mind. 
God sends his son into the world. He grows up, lives a sinless life, loves the people around him, does miracles, heals people, raises people from the dead. But there are people around him who fear what he's doing, that it may upset the apple cart, may upset the balance of power, may put them out of a job. And so they rise up against him. They arrest him and beat him. They take him to a a kangaroo court with false accusers and they convict him because they can't put him to death. They take him to the Romans. Pilate beats him and then convicts him. When all is said and done, the religious leaders have their way because Jesus is nailed to a cross. He is being put out of their misery. He's dying. But that's not enough for them. In their hate, in their spite, even as he's there hopeless and helpless, nailed to a cross, do you remember what they do? They mock him. He saved others. Let him save himself. Hey, if you're the Christ, come down from there. Do you remember what Jesus said? Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. Do you understand? Jesus takes the love of God, and he moves it completely out of any box even remotely resembling fairness. And he puts it squarely in the box of sacrifice. You remember a few hours later? Jesus is still on the cross. He is nearing the end of his life, breathing the last moments, last breaths. Now remember, he still has never sinned, never commanded a single offense against God. In fact, he's the only, the only person who's ever had that perfect communion, that perfect relationship with his heavenly Father. And all of a sudden, he says these words, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? You know what has happened, right? While Jesus never sinned, the reality is in those moments, he's carrying your sin and my sin. God has laid the iniquity of us all upon his son. And instead of turning away from you and me in our lives, in our messes, in our brokenness, he turns his back on Jesus. That is not about fairness. It's about sacrifice. Dear friends, if you and I are going to understand this virtue of love, this fruit of the Spirit called love, then we've got to understand that it comes from God and it's limitless. That it's it's about action, not thoughts or words. It's about action. And when all is said and done, it's about actions that are sacrificial not self-serving or fair. You know, I have one more thought to share with you about love. There's a, a verse. Can we put it on the screen? Read it with me. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. You know, love really does involve connection, doesn't it? That God loved us and sent his son into the world. In fact, I want to encourage you, folks, call your moms today. And when you call them, remember, you're not just calling out of obligation. You You are calling them because of who they are and what they mean to you. You know, it's sort of funny. My mom, I always call her on Sunday afternoon. But sometimes a service or travel or something will will mess that up. And and my mom is she's just a cute person. Because she will never say, why didn't you call me? I'll get this note on Facebook. Sometimes it's a private message. Sometimes it's on my page. Sometimes it's, it's, Lord only knows where it will show up. But she'll say, hey, son, I love you. Is everything okay? 
Because that connection matters, doesn't it? You know, I think I've told you this story before. Uh, Several years ago, Julie and the kids and I were going to Michigan on Christmas Day. So I hadn't been home on Christmas Day for 20-some years. And so this was going to be a big surprise. We finished Christmas Eve services. We got home uh, late. We were going to head out in the wee hours of the morning, get on an airplane, fly to Detroit, drive home. And I'd arranged this whole surprise with my siblings. Now, I didn't think it was going to work, but it was amazing. They did a great job. Mom had no idea that we were coming. Everything, the plan was absolutely on track. Until a friend of mine... Greg Stiles. You guys know Greg Stiles, don't you? (laughs) Greg Stiles decided he was going to do this wonderful thing for for the kids and Julie and I and for everybody. He and and Jennifer were going to have Lou Melnati's pizza, one of the pizza that we love. He was going to have that delivered to my mom's house one of the nights while we were there as sort of a surprise. So nobody had to cook. It was going to be easy, except he wanted this to be a surprise. Now, you know, I hadn't told Greg that it was a surprise that I was going home. I didn't really figure I had to. Why would he ever talk to my mom? But he doesn't want to ruin his surprise and ask Julie what my mom's address or ask me what my mom's address was or one of the kids. And so Greg figures the most logical thing in the world, he's going to call my mom and ask her. He picks up the phone. Hey, Pat. I know Bill and the kids, uh, Bill and Julie and the kids are going to be there over Christmas, and I just wanted to send some pizza. Jen and I thought you guys might enjoy that. You know, my mom, again, being so cute, she's like, oh. (laughs) And she gives him the address, and Greg has no idea what he's done. A few days later, we were in one of our planning meetings, and I was saying, you know what, so we're going to head out early Christmas morning, we're going to surprise my mom and show up to celebrate Christmas, and Greg's faith, I mean, his whole countenance visibly fell. He was immediately contrite because he had ruined this surprise, absolutely destroyed this Christmas gift. Now, do you really think that he ruined that? Or do you think my mom was still delighted to have her family together? She was. Dear friends, love is about connectedness. And that's why our God didn't sit on his throne and pronounce his love to us. He sent his son into the world that we might be saved through him. You know, my prayer today is that you have a wonderful celebration. But above all else, my prayer is that God, by His Spirit, will work in your heart and your life through your words and your actions to make you a virtuoso of love. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face shine on you and be gracious to you. May He lift up His countenance upon you and give you His peace. And as you leave this place, go into the world and shine like stars in the universe as you hold out the message of life.